Hi everyone, Andy at Maltech, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Fox E-Balls and how they work. It's kind of a mystery to everybody. A lot of people think they just have air in them, and that is not true. Uh, so today we're going to go over these Fox E-Balls. Um, we are a full authorized dealer. Um, we're also an authorized service center through Fox. We've been through all the training from Fox, um, so we know exactly what to do to them. And I believe to this day there's only a couple of us. Uh, a couple of authorized service centers other than Fox. Uh, and also to buy parts through Fox, you have to be an authorized service center. So today we're going to show you, we've got a few specimens here. Um, the first thing we're going to go over is the difference between the Generation 1 and Generation 2. I've had a lot of people that call up and say, hey, I want to buy the new Generation 2s. And I tell them there's no reason to do Generation 2 because there's only one, there's a couple main differences. We've got them here. As you can see, the, uh, the E-Ball is cast on the Generation 2s, or the old Generation 1, it's bolted on. One extra seal in here, no big deal, no advantage. The other main, the biggest difference they changed is the seal, um, which is which seals this main air chamber when you put your main pressure in the main air chamber. Um, as you can see here on this shock, there is two lips on this seal, one there and one right there. Well that causes extra stiction, and stiction is the amount of force it takes to get this shock to start moving. This is a generation two seal. As you can see, there's only one lip. And we did some dynoing. Um, I believe there's 25 pounds difference is how much it takes to start this movie. Less on these new ones. Get the shot to start moving. Um, you wonder why we charge so much on these. I'm gonna dump these seals out here. And this is how many seals are in two shocks. We can zoom in here and see closer how many seals are actually replaced in all these shocks whenever we rebuild one of these shocks. So that's why it costs so much. Um, another thing a lot of people don't realize, like I said before, is these shocks air shock, they also have coil in them. Uh, here's a shock, this is the Evil Gen 2. As you can see, this chamber here slides up and down. You see how much force it takes just to get it to start moving. All your air is in here, and there's your seal that I was showing you. So your air chamber is here. Up above this, we have another seal. Here's another one of these air sleeves. These are called the Samurai Seals. Now these seals, there's air in here, but every time this shock compresses, it pushes air out, and every time it extends, it sucks air in. Well, after time, we put one of these pillow packs in there. Have you ever seen this blue goo come out, which is perfectly normal, out of your Samurai Seal? That actually goes away after a while, and you'll get to where these shocks start sticking real hard. And you're going to feel it, noticeably feel them stiffer on the track also. But that's why these need rebuilt quite often. I said also these do have oil in them. Here's your body. And this is completely filled with oil, and you have your valving just like a regular shock has and nitrogen and that's what this reservoir here is you have a floating piston internally and I'm going to show in a little bit kind of a cutaway that I drew out how these work um, when you send your shocks into us this is typically what we get we see a lot worse than this please clean your shocks as you can see all the dirt on these shocks these were just sent to us pretty much this is fairly typical 
they're any worse than this, we're going to charge you to clean them. I mean, this is the same, this is his twin here, and you can see we've fully gone through and cleaned this shock up. You can see the difference between the two here. So please clean your shocks. Alright, now I'm going to show a cutaway. of what's happening here. On a typical spring shock, you're not going to have this air sleeve. And the way I've drawn this, everything in green is just like a spring shock. Everything in purple is what they've added to an air shock. And when you put pressure in here, your low pressure pump goes on here, which should only be used for ride height. That is it. That, when you pump that up, all that air goes into here. And you can see there's a piston here. And this piston is right here. And it just floats up and down and separates your high and low pressure. And of course, when you put your high pressure in, this is where your high pressure is on this side of the piston. Now, to start moving this piston, we have more pressure on this side, less on this side. So, as we compress this shock down, it's going to raise the pressure of this low pressure system. As it overcomes or actually equals this pressure in the high pressure chamber is it going to start moving this piston and you're going to start getting a bottom crossover um, what they call it on a spring shock um, you're going to actually feel it get stiffer here is the chamber This is your samurai seal right here and here, and this is what I was talking about. This is actually blowing in and sucking out every time this shock cycles. This is where your oil is. This is all oil, 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 oil in here. We have to have a bunch of specialty tools in order to remove and take these shocks apart. We also have a, you have to set this floating piston at a, at a certain recommendation per Fox. Um, that's something else that only dealers have access to, to know what that floating piston height should be. Um, and this is where your nitrogen goes. This is full of nitrogen. We've got a Schrader valve here also that we install the nitrogen. It has to be set to a certain PSI to keep this shock from cavitating. If you notice this little purple thing here is a spring. Now what that is, is a negative spring. That negative spring counter-reacts the air pressure in your main chamber. And the reason for that, on a spring shock, you can run no preload. You can preload it if you want the spring. You can have the ZPS spring to get a lower ride height. Well, with air pressure, you always have pressure pushing out. No matter what pressure you have in there, it's always going to be pressing out. So, instead of having the shocks at full extension, when you get your ride height set, this is actually going to suck the shock back together. And I'm going to show you here what that negative spring looks like. This is your negative spring. And as that, you can see it start to compress that as the shock's trying to pull apart, it's counter-reacting that and sucking the shock back to get it, achieve a lower ride height. Another thing is, on this two pressures, you always want to fill the higher pressure first. And the reason is, it's going to force this puck all the way to the bottom. If you were to put your low pressure side first, it's going to push it all the way up. Then when you fill your high pressure side, it's going to push it back down, which is going to raise your pressure in your low chamber pressure side. So always, and if you have high pressure first, you're not going to overcome that to start moving that puck. So that's why you always recommend 
putting the high pressure side in first. You have to or else it's going to throw you all off. Another thing is always have the bike off the ground. Because if you had the bike on the ground when you put your pressures in, it's going to be all over the place every time that you adjust your pressure. Because it's going to be pushing this shock together, which is going to give you a false reading on your pressure gauge. Okay, now we're going to show you the pressure changes on these and also how much shaft travel and when this... Um, evolve chamber starts to take effect and also how much bottoming pressure it has and the differences with different pressures. Uh, we have the silver line or silver gauge hooked up to the evolve and the black gauge is hooked up to the main chamber which remind you to only set your right height off of is the only purpose for that. Okay as you can see we have 25 pounds just barely over we're gonna set that down to right at 25 all right, 25 in our main chamber and 150 in our evolve chamber, which is just a hair over two. We're going to get a more accurate reading here. Okay. We're going to start compressing these. And as soon as our main chamber pressure equals 150, he's going to go down. And you're going to see as soon as it hits 150, the gauges are going to equalize out and we're going to stay the same pressure but that piston is going to start moving as soon as that hits the same pressure in your evolve chamber. Alright, both gauges are moving equally now, you can see. Both moving the same. Alright, he's going to raise back up until the main chamber pressure is 150 now, and we're going to take a measurement then. He's going to go down until it says 150 on the main chamber. And that's when our evolve starts moving. And he's going to stop there, right there. Now we're going to take a measurement with a tape measure. Of our shaft travel. As you can see, it's right at 4 inches exactly. Is where our shaft is at right now. Alright, now we're going to go ahead and he's going to compress all the way down until it's bottomed out. We're going to read our pressures then. All the way down. Okay, so we're right at 275, let's call it. Okay, now we're going to change our pressures. And we're going to up our main chamber pressure until it reads 40, 35, 40 pounds. All right, now I'm going to back it off until it reads right at 35 pounds. It's about right in there. Okay, now we're going to check this again. So we're it's still going to start moving the evol chamber at the 150 pound range. So it's going to go down to 150 and stop right there. That's where our evolve takes an effect. We're going to measure our shaft travel again. Which now is four and a quarter inches. So, it's getting on our evolve chamber a quarter of an inch quicker. So think about that when you're turning a corner. Alright, now we can go all the way till it compresses fully. With 175 in the Evo chamber and 35 in the main chamber, and we come up with 350 pounds. Okay, now we're going to go over here, and I've drawn out a little graph. And this graph, as you can see, we've got our different pressures, different colors. So we've got 25 pounds in our main, 150 in the Evo, 35 in the main, 150 in the Evo, and then we changed our Evo chamber on this one to 175, kept our main at 35. So I've graphed this out, and what we have on this line is shaft travel, and what we have on this line is, of course, our pounds in our chambers. Um, as you can see with the orange, we're going to start at a lower pressure, 25, 
and it's actually going to get on this chamber later and we're not going to have near the bottoming resistance but when we change our main chamber which is also ride height we're going to get on it a little bit quicker so we're going to cross out quicker we're going to also bottom a little bit more too now what's tricky is when you change that evolt pressure higher we're going to be on the exact same plane no matter what the main when the main pressure does not change you're actually going to be on the same plane but we're going to be back here and really this line should be moved we're going to move this back and it's going to be right over top where this other one because we measured right about four inches and then it's going to shoot up to 350 pounds so you really have to think about this as you're adjusting your pressures and what they do in my opinion, like I said before, I can't stress enough, set your ride height off your main chamber. If you have to go more than 175 pounds, 200 pounds on your EVO chamber, it's going to be a valving issue. You need to start adjusting your clickers here. This is a high and low speed compression adjustable um, adjuster as where is this other shock here this gen 1 only has the compression adjuster one compression adjuster all right when you run out of adjustments on your compression adjusters is the only time that you need to go internally in this shock and start making valving changes, which is the shim stacks rebound compression on this piston. And that's the only time. Usually, those are going to go off what your leverage ratio is on your A arm, is going to be your biggest factor on how stiff or how much main chamber air pressure. Most A arms, we have the specs for them, so if you call up um, or just email us at Andy of Maltech. We'll respond, we'll tell you what you need to start off with as pressures and the good recommendations. So I hope this helped everyone on understanding more what the uh, box e bolts are all about, you know, all the myths and everything, and actually how they work. Uh, I wish there was a way you could actually put a pressure gauge on your shocks while you're riding. That would really tell you, you know, am I bottoming them completely if you had one that went up and it stopped at a certain spot. Uh, another thing you can video someone, you can compress your shock all the way down until it bottoms out. And you can see, because you can see we don't use, you're not going to use all that shaft travel that's on here on your body because this is just a sleeve over it. You could actually put a longer sleeve on here and it wouldn't change anything at all. Um, so if we had a gauge that jumped up and